that is good. Okay. So hi, my name is Alex Komorowski. I'm a product manager. I work on Chrome's open web platform team. Um, but before that, I was actually working as a web developer myself. So a lot of this stuff really rings true to me. Um, I've loved the web platform from way back before it was popular, and I love it even more now. So the stuff I'll talk about tonight is actually a little bit different than the kinds of things you heard earlier, because it's more forward-looking. Um, we're going to be talking about web components in particular. So you might be thinking, well, what are web components? Well, I actually, uh, oops, do I? I actually think you know what a component is, because you're using them already today. You just aren't using web components, per se. So uh, if you're having an embedded widget on your site, uh, say a like button or a plus one button, those are widgets, right? Those are web components that you're putting on your page. Now today, uh, this is a, a situation where you have a third party uh, that doesn't necessarily want you to be able to touch their code that you put on their site, because then you could mess with, do you know, fake likes and that kind of stuff. And you don't necessarily want them to be able to reach out and change your page, because then they could break stuff. Um, so the people who write these components will say, well, um, please use discipline and don't uh, uh, write your style sheets in a way that's going to accidentally trample over my styles. But of course the people who are embedding these things are saying, ah, that's etiquette. I'll follow it if I please. But and what you get in the end is a lot of uh, people just giving up and saying, let's just use iframes for these components. You also have another use case which is widget framework. So if you need a tab strip in your application, you almost certainly don't write it yourself because tons of people have already written them. Use one of a, from a toolkit or a framework library. Um, the problem here is that each of them are written in incompatible ways. So say you're using uh, Dojo or something, and then you decide, oh, I really like that date picker from Clojure. Well, too bad, they're written in ways that don't work together, and so you can't uh, use them interoperably. In fact, if you look on Stack Overflow, you'll see that a lot of people ask this question, hey, how do I use a jQuery UI widget with something else? And it just, it just doesn't work. They're using different ways of expressing the exact same concept. And the last time is, uh, bear with me for a second, this one's a little bit different. Um, when you're writing your own applications on your own pages, uh, you're having also custom built widgets on your own pages. So you're familiar with spaghetti code, right, where you have all kinds of crazy knotted mess and it's impossible to understand. And you don't want that. You want to be able to encapsulate your logic, because otherwise it's impossible to build a big app. But of course, the primitives on the web platform don't really allow you to untangle that spaghetti fully. So what you get is layered, sure, but it's kind of still a little bit messy. So you have kind of like lasagna code, right? So you've tried to get to that point of a, a really clear encapsulation, but you can't really do it. Um, so that's sort of the world of components today. That we're all sort of tackling these problems that we're using JavaScript to do it, lots of other frameworks to do it, and they can't really do it perfectly. So today we're going to be d digging into a specific pull app we built for this. So let me just take you over to the app. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It just allows you to vote on a question. We've got um, the question here, a subtitle. We've got different options. When you hover over them, they uh, show a tooltip. You can select them. And then we have a, an accordion here that shows you the results that you've got. There's really nothing all that amazing going on here. But uh, let's dig into the code. This is the web platform, so we can do that. And let's dig in and see what's going on in uh, the script here. So what you can see here, and if I don't have it sized exactly correctly, let me see if I can do this. What you see here is the JavaScript that's running this thing. Um, this looks pretty standard, nothing crazy going on here, but let's dig into it. So I've got, uh, right here, I've got a window.pull, I've created my, uh, an object here. I have a this.views, which is an object I'm creating. Um, and then I'm also appending stuff inside of it. I'm creating this parallel hierarchy of JavaScript objects that relate to DOM objects. The DOM already is a hierarchy, but I have an additional one over in JavaScript world, or over sort of this bizarro world. I'm also uh, taking an empty div that's on the page, and when I uh, run this initialize function, I'm loading up and jamming some stuff into it. Unfortunately, if you look at that HTML that's coming down the wire, there's nothing there. It's just a div. So if I were to look through that as a search engine, if I were to look through that um, in a browser that didn't support JavaScript or something, I would see nothing. There's nothing there. And finally, what I'm doing here is we have this convention of where we're going to hold on to these DOM objects that represent us. So you can see that in this, uh, we decided to use this dot dollar sign L. But there's, that's just a convention that we decided to use. If we were working with other widgets that had called it this dot ELE or this dot, uh, dot DOM element, 
it wouldn't necessarily work. They're following different conventions. And then if you look actually into the DOM itself and inspect one of these things, you'll see there's actually a whole bunch of cruft in here. So if I glance at this, at this HTML, this DOM structure, it's not necessarily obvious what's going on. Like it's a poll widget, but it doesn't look like a poll widget. There's all kinds of random stuff in there just to make it display correctly on the screen. Um, so you really have your view mixed with your model. Uh, the other thing is that this is, uh, this is really brittle. It's defensive programming where you can't control which pieces can mess with your DOM elsewhere. So like I had some JavaScript that created some of these elements, but if someone else, some other script comes in and touches those elements and does something else to them, it's all just going to stop working. And we're going to have no way of defending against that. And so the way you defend is by having etiquette. Please don't touch the DOM objects directly. Please touch them through these bizarre world JavaScript objects over here. Right? So this is just a simple example, a toy example. But of course, in, in the real world, it gets much, much more, uh, more complicated. So let's switch back over here and switch to Gmail, which is something that actually, I'm going to show you something that gives me nightmares. I, I kid you not. I'm going to inspect into Gmail. Just pick a random element. Look at this. Look at all these things that are just jammed in there. It's a mail view. It's a list view right here, right? This is really, this is really crazy. Um, so you're probably looking at this and you're thinking to yourself, this is just what you do, right? This is just how it works on the web platform today. But I submit to you that this is insane. This doesn't make any sense whatsoever. Um, we have, we're writing all this JavaScript, all this code to do pretty simple stuff. More code means more time to write it. It means more time to push it down the wire. It means more time to debug it. And guaranteed, the more code you write, the more bugs you're going to have. Um, it means that this world where we have semantic elements in HTML5 and before, we aren't using them. We're, we're building something else crazy in JavaScript. The one good thing, though, um, is that this isn't really your fault. This is just sort of the fault of the platform. And how does this come to be today? The way I think of it, is that the web platform of today is like this highway. It's got a lot of really cool technologies that generally work together pretty well. And as long as you're staying on that highway or cruising along, you can do some really cool stuff really quickly. But then you run into a pothole. There's a piece that's missing that doesn't do exactly what you want it to do. And you say, that's okay. I have JavaScript. I can fix this problem myself. And so you write a little bit of script. You go a little bit off-road. Everything's okay. But then you're off-road and you're trucking along and you come up to a boulder because, I mean, you're off-road, right? You're in this JavaScript world. And you say, that's okay. I can solve it with a little bit more JavaScript. And of course, had you been on the highway in the first place, you wouldn't need to go even further off-road. And so what ends up happening is you end up going all the way off-road. So these little potholes become giant, heaping pits of despair. It's absolutely <laughs> insane, right? And the thing is, if you think to yourself, I'm not doing this. I'm, I'm staying and using the, the platform to its full potential, I'm not rewriting stuff in the script. Well, the thing is, the frameworks you're using are doing it for you. So when you're using these really cool frameworks that are really well engineered, they solve a lot of really cool problems, they don't have the right primitives. And so they're solving in a way that's taking you into these pits of despair. OK, so I'm going to take a step back. You can tell I get kind of worked up about this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> um, you're, and I'm being sort of doom and gloom. But I do have good news for you, and the good news is that it's not my job to really think about these pits of despair, um, because I actually come to you from the future. So I actually, <laughs> <laughs> I'm one of the guys who thinks, what if there were a better way? What if we weren't stuck with these potholes? And the answer, if you hadn't guessed, is going to be web components. So what is web components? Well, you might think it's some crazy, totally new technology off to the side you're going to have to learn some Thing that will be, you know, require you to use XML or other weird technologies or new syntaxes or whatever. It's really not. It's really just filling in those potholes from, from before with three separate pieces: Shadow DOM, custom element, custom elements, and templates. So let me dive into those in a little bit more depth. We'll spend the rest of this talk talking about them some more. Um, Shadow DOM is the piece of this, this one pothole filler that just allows you to express, uh, to encapsulate things within the DOM. So we noticed we had a whole bunch of cruft in the DOM to make it look right on screen. And you still need that. They're very powerful technology, but sometimes you're going to need that kind of stuff. But we don't want you to sort of see that when you poke through the DOM. Right? We want you to see something that's more semantic, that's more clear about what you actually mean. And if we allow you to hide some of that extra cruft off to the side, well, then you can make it so you only have one hierarchy, which is DOM itself, and not have this bizarro world off to the side. Custom elements basically allows you to find your own tags. 
So we already have, for example, the details and summary element. Wouldn't it be great if you could just define your own ones that just worked in the same basic way? Well, custom elements allows you to package these things up, tell the browser about it, say, hey, when you see a um, tab strip element, here's what it means, here's what you should do, here's the stuff that you should do to make this work correctly. And also, of course, allows you to define your own imperative APIs, your own JavaScript methods on these objects we get back from the DOM. And the final piece is templates. So in that example I showed you, we were taking strings of HTML and cramming it and using jQuery to turn it into a, a document fragment and jamming it into the document. But that's kind of crazy, right? Because normally we just write HTML in an HTML docu document. And then it's more clear where the, the uh, syntax highlighters and Sublime will you know, correct you if you get it wrong or what have you. Um, so templates just allows you to define these bits of, of, of document you're going to need again and again. Somewhere where they don't do anything, they're off to the side, so you don't have to worry about scripts going or sounds playing or any kinds of crazy crap. But when you need it, you just clone one into existence and, is existence and plop it into the DOM. So these three things together form this broader concept of web components. And not, not a sing none of them are actually all that complicated when you take them in isolation, but when you put them together, you can do some really, really cool stuff. So this would allow you to just move from that sort of that world of all that crush that we saw in the DOM inspector to something more like this, just saying what you mean. So if you look through this code, it's a little bit hard to see on the screen. We've got an X poll up here. We've got some images, some H1s, an X choice which, with a, a header and a paragraph. And that's basically it. If you look at this, you can actually figure out, oh, what he's expressing on this page is a poll with these options, with these tooltips and, and what have you. This exact code could drive that same demo we had that I showed you uh, just a few minutes ago. So you can have this world where this is what you send on the wire. This is what you see when you expect it in the web inspector. So uh, let's, let me show you that. Uh, so let's see. So I have right here, uh, this is the, the example in the world to, of today. And this, let me just make sure I actually did switch, yep. Uh, this is the world uh, rewritten in web component style. Um, so you can see it's got basically exactly the same behaviors. It has the tooltips just like before. But if I look in and see what's going on, you can see that actually I have the exact thing that I'm showing you on this screen. There's extra cruft in there somewhere making it display the correct way, but it's hidden away. So as I, as I walk through this DOM, I don't see any craziness in here. It's all very semantic. It's very clear what this means. Okay, so that's sort of, uh, clearly there's some magic going on here, and to explain what's going on, I'm going to have to walk you through some more of these concepts. So let's switch back to the presentation. Um, and I'm going to take you and, and explain to you how this stuff works. Now, you're going to see some sort of confusing stuff, but keep in mind that um, in the future, when you use these components, the users of the components, the ones who actually use tab strips and polls and what have you, they'll have a very simple declarative world. Just one include, and then just use it in your HTML like any other tag. It will just work. It's going to be very, very simple. The people who are going to be creating, creating these components will have to know a little bit more about all the innards, how this craft works behind the scenes to make it all work. So if you find yourself getting a little bit confused, uh, don't worry, we're behind the scenes. In the real, real world, you won't have to actually really understand that kind of stuff. One thing I should say here, too, is you might say, this is all confusing and crazy. Well, you know what? All the frameworks today do this. They will do it for you when they present very nice, clean abstractions about what's going on in your document. But they can't do it in the browser. This is the browser doing it itself, which means that it can go faster because it's native code. And you also don't need a build step. You just ship it down to the browser and it just works. So the first concept that I'm going to introduce is, is Shadow DOM. I'm going to go through it in a little bit more depth. What I have here is a video element, just a normal video element inside of my presentation. Um, and if you look at it, it's got uh, controls down here. If I inspect this element in the DOM inspector, I will see that I've got basically just a video tag. There's nothing inside of it. But you can see I've got these controls and things that I can interact with, um, that I can click and, and, and do other things with. How are those implemented? Well, the secret is that on the WebKit team and really every browser engine, we want to use the same tools that you guys are using. So why should we have to go through and write uh, complicated drawing functions when we've got HTML and CSS and JavaScript, they work just fine. So actually, the way that these are implemented in reality in WebKit and in lots of other browsers is just as normal divs and spans and buttons and things that you're familiar with. In fact, when you see animations in here, it's actually using CSS animations. But you don't have to believe me because I'm going to show you and prove to you it's true. So what I'm going to do is go through 
and turn on this experimental property in the web inspector that's going to show me the shadow DOM. And I'm going to restart inspector and inspect this element. And now you see that actually inside of it is this thing called shadow root. And if I expand it, I see that I have divs and I've got, um, I've got a couple more divs than I probably need. But I've got inputs, so I've got uh, that just for these different buttons. It's all stuff you're very familiar with. So Shadow DOM isn't new, it's actually a tried and tested technology. What's new is putting in the hands of web developers so they can do the same kind of stuff. So let's walk through the concepts to make it all work. The first thing, here on this, on this slide I've got a uh, logical DOM that you're used to walking through with first child and you know, get children and that kind of thing. And over here off the right in the purple is the Shadow DOM. So each element in the, uh, uh, each element in the DOM can now have a shadow element, a shadow root hanging off the side. And you walk when you walk through the DOM, you won't see that purple stuff hanging off to the side unless you go looking for it, and then you'll find it. Um, but so, and then when you render your document in this case, really nothing extra would happen. But the secret is what happens when you render. So when you're walking through, you see the exact same thing. But when we render, if you have a shadow root defined, what we show on the screen is effectively like we just cut out all that stuff you had, the logical stuff from the DOM and transplanted the stuff that was hanging off to the side. So these are the, the shadow root nodes. They're displaying on the screen just like they were un children of that green element. But in reality, logically, if you walk through it, the green element would still be there. So that's not really that useful, right? Because I actually probably had content in there I actually wanted to show. And that's why Shadow DOM has one extra uh, idea, which is the notion of insertion points. So here in my Shadow DOM, I've got two insertion points. And these are basically holes that we can shine through the logical DOM into. So we define, uh, I'll tell you how in a second, which types of these elements we want to teleport into these holes when we render. So what effectively happens is when we render, you see a document, a composed document that looks like this. So uh, all of this is, is sort of complicated, but basically you have a shadow DOM. You have ways of grabbing things from the document and putting it in, in having it render like that. And again, uh, actually, frameworks are doing this today. So jQuery UI, uh, if you want to use a tab strip, the way you do it is you have a header, and then you have a section for the actual content of the, of the tab. And then after the document loads, you call this magical tab strip method. And that goes through and it hoists all those things, and it jiggers the DOM and creates new elements and takes your stuff and puts it in new places. This is basically doing the same thing, except it's leaving all the stuff where it was. Only when we render it to the screen is when we logically sort of conceptually uh, move it around. So the way that we would implement XChoice then that we showed in that do uh, uh, demo is with something like this. So we have the XChoice here, and inside of the shadow, we have our div with our ID of icon, our class of maps, just normal stuff. And then this content element, this is the, that imp insertion point. And you can see we have a select statement here. And the select statement actually just takes any CSS selector. So we're using a selection you know, uh, uh, syntax that we're already familiar with for us to define which elements we want to grab and put in here. Then we have the aside for the tooltip, and we've got another content that says, anything that you didn't grab for that first selector, just cram the rest of it in here. Select everything else and put it in here. Um, and then if you, so this allows you flexibility over to the expose. So I could have decided that I didn't want to actually expose anything except for that first H3. And everything else I could have left and not rendered at all. Um, so let's look at this in the actual example. We'll switch back. And we'll inspect this with the web inspector. And we're going to turn on Shadow DOM here as well. Restart it. And now you'll see that we have our shadow root here as well. And you can see that we've got stuff hanging off to the side, um, just like I showed in this, uh, on the screen there. OK, so that's how, that's how you can sort of decide, uh, have, tell it where, which elements you want to have on the screen. Um, but how do you actually use it? Well, you would define it basically in a special document uh, with this element tag where you'd say, I want my tag to be called xchoice. I want it to be basically like a div. And here's the JavaScript constructor for that object that I want you to, to, to call whenever you see it. Then you have a template element that just defines that shadow DOM stuff right there. So again, template just being a place for you to put normal HTML, and it just sort of hangs around, and will automatically put that into the shadow DOM for you. Then in your script, you can define methods on, your, on that object that you defined. So this is how you as an author of components would define what a component is and how it acts. The end user, it's much more simple. They just say, okay, 
include a link to that document that the author wrote, and then inside their doc, uh, inside of their HTML, just use an export, just like it's any other element. And then if they grab that from the DOM, if they say document.querySelector and get me all the, the X polls, they get back an object that has all these methods on it. So they get back, so instead of having this world where you have a JavaScript object and a DOM object, use a DOM object that has all the methods on it that you need. So one of the other parts that's hard about styling is that you need to be able to not have your styles leak out into the rest of the document and vice versa. Um, and that's, we have a tool for that as well, which is implicitly scoped styles. So a style that's inside of a template, inside of the Shadow DOM, will by default only affect things inside of that, of that Shadow DOM. So here we have a style sheet with a selector that selects everything and says, hey, make everything red. But it's only actually affecting this one paragraph because that's the only thing inside of here. The things outside of here are not affected. Now that's so that's sort of make sure that your styles that you define in your component don't accidentally go through and mess everything else up. But it also, uh, in, by default, styles that hit your component won't come through. There's a shield. It shields the document styles from you. So you don't, you don't have to worry about someone going through and changing all kinds of weird settings and stuff and, and reaching in, inside of your component and changing crap you don't want to change because you have this shield that protects it. So in, this, in my example I had, I was using an accordion for the control to switch between the uh, voting page and the, and the results page, but that's not exactly a good UI metaphor. We want to switch that, uh, and we want to use uh, TabStrip instead. So this actually is going to be really straightforward. All we're going to do um, is we're going to change and include a, the definition of the TabStrip that we want to use, and then we're just going to go through and replace x-accordion in our code with x-tabs. So I can switch to Sublime, which is the one I use. I'm going to change this from uh, x um, uh, x.accordion to x.tabs. I've already done the include correctly. And I'll refresh. There you go. And it switched into the tab strip automatically. So I did very bit of little work as a component user to switch to a different, totally different type of component. There wasn't any kind of wrangling to get these JavaScripts to include correctly. They're just basically different tags I can use. Okay, um, so this stuff is um, is all about making a component on your own page uh, that you where you trust everything around it. But say that you want to include components on other pages. So I, one of the guys I work uh, who works on this, who's actually the author of the web component spec, is this guy named Dimitri, and he has um, a very interesting design sensibility. Here's his blog. Um, I don't know if I necessarily agree with all the style choices he's made. But he has he's you know he's got design, developed his own design aesthetic, and he asked me before I came here. He's like, hey, I really want to be able to put one of your polls onto my, uh, onto my page. I was like, cool, I want you to use the poll I wrote, but I don't necessarily want him to go, be able to go through and tweak all the styling and, and change around answers and stuff. So I don't want him to be able to peek inside of my component and change things. And that's okay. What we're gonna do is we're going to change what's exposed in the DOM. So by default, everything in the shadow is just sort of hanging off to the side. Anyone who wants can go poke around and change it. But it's actually possible to sort of hide that stuff, to put it in the shadow and then throw out the shadow, the reference to it, so no one else can get inside and muck with it. So what I'm going to do is take my exact same component, I'm going to define a new component called uh, awesome poll for Dimitri's site, and because I think he, he loves the word awesome and so he'll love this, and I'm going to basically just take it and take all that stuff I had defined in that last example and stuff it into the shadow of a new component. So when you look at it in the DOM, you aren't going to see anything. It's just X awesome poll, and that's it. That's all that you see in, this, in the site. Um, so Dimitri can't go through and change, for example, um, the question titles or, or the coloring or anything. So we'll go and switch to his blog again. And here you go. You've got basically, you've got that exact same thing in his site um, embedded in there. But really, right now, all I've got basically is an iframe. You can do exactly this with an iframe, right? You already have uh, guaranteed security boundaries. Why would you want to do it this way? Well, I can allow more customability and customizability to Dimitri. So uh, he said he wanted to change some of the text and make it fit in with the way that he likes to, you know, the copy he likes to write. But I'm not really comfortable with him changing, say, the title of the question or, uh, or some of the other stuff in here. Because I don't want him to be able to change the poll so it says, vote for the semantics option, because that's not what I want him to be able to do, right? Um, but that's okay, because Web Components allows me to decide which things I'm comfortable with him changing. So what I can do is say, is define it so that 
when you include an aside, I'll take that and I'll use that as my subtitle for the question. And when you include a label, uh, I'll use that and I'll make it the text for the button to su submit the vote. But I decide, based on which uh, insertion points I have in my Shadow DOM, which things I want to allow him to change. So I'm def defining my own declarative API. If he were to go through and, and pop in an H1 here or something, i just ignore it and drop it on the floor. <coughs> and so we'll do that. We'll switch to the, uh, to the example here. We'll uncomment it, this section, save and refresh. And now you'll see actually that he's changed it and said vote for CSS3 because it's awesome. And his, the vote now button has switched to his text that he wanted there. And again, I gave him control over small pieces of the DOM of this component, but not all of them. But then he got angry at me when I showed him this because he said, yeah, but your color scheme is kind of stupid. I said, he's got a point. It doesn't really fit in with this all that well. But I, I don't know if I want him to go through and change around and mess with all the very carefully calibrated layouts I've gotten here. So. I'm going to allow him to uh, control parts of the layout, but only some parts. And the way I'll do this is with something called CSS variables. And you may have heard of CSS variables. You may have used them if you use SAS or LESS or something like that. CSS variables is a new spec. It's actually going to be start sh shipping in Chrome very soon that actually allows you to basically do this in the browser, uh, in the browser directly without a preprocessor. Um, here's a very simple example you define on the root. A, a variable called my color. You give it a color of green. Um, you use you define my border, where it is one bit solid with my color, which would be green. And then elsewhere, you just use that variable right here. Now, CSS variables is kind of misunderstood. It's actually incredibly powerful. It does all kinds of interesting things uh, that you can do with having these values cascade differently and using them elsewhere. But this is all you need to know to understand how this example is going to work. I really do encourage you, though, to go learn about CSS variables and figure out how they work. Um, so now that we have that, what we can do as a component author is we can use variables inside of our components and define where in our style sheets we want to use these components. And then if, an if a component user then targets a style at that component from the outside, we basically say, OK, those things that I've defined a variable for, I'm going to allow those styles to snake through that, that barrier I've created. So most styles that Dimitri tries to, to style out my component just sort of bounce right off. He can't get inside. But I've poked specific holes for him where I've said, I'm OK if you reach in here and tweak this thing. So in this case, I've said, I'm OK if you change the font or if you change uh, one of the, the highlight color. So let's switch to his example and change that. Save and switch back. And now you can see that he's used it to make his heading a different color, and the font is actually subtly Comic Sans, which in his words is the best font ever. Um, but I don't know. Um, so what I've done here is I've defined a component that I've felt good about letting him use on his site. I've given him very specific hooks to change just the things I'm comfortable with. I don't have to give him the keys to the kingdom and should change everything around. I can uh, define his very interesting declarative APIs. So I've been talking sort of about the tactical bits of web components, but I'm going to take a step back and tell you why I'm so excited about this stuff. And I call it the, the declarative renaissance, and sometimes people think I'm kind of being a little bit um, uh, melodramatic about this, but I really do feel strongly that, that this web components as a technology will enable a very different kind of web ecosystem. So a lot of different ways. One of them is having these guardrails, not etiquette. So I was able to give Dimitri the guardrails of say, here's the things I'm going to allow you to touch in my component, instead of saying, here's my component, and in the documentation say, pretty, pretty, pretty please, don't touch these things or your thing might break. I can, very, I can direct him into where he's allowed to switch things. Um, this is a subtle point, but if everyone is building on the same um, foundations, these same primitives, um, that means that, that widgets from different libraries will be compatible. So today, they're all written in incompatible ways because there's nothing, there's no good way to express it, so they've all invented their own way of doing it. But here, if they're all using the DOM, if they're all using web components, this, this toolkit framework kind of, then they can build uh, widgets that all just work together. So instead of having everyone split up and create uh, you know, eight different calendar widgets for eight, the eight different UI toolkits and eight different tab strips, well, now you can mix and match as a user the ones that you like. So that means that people can focus on uh, improving the ones that everyone already uses as opposed to, as opposed to building yet another tab strip. Multiple authors on the same page. So again, this is the guardrails, not etiquette. This means that you can write pages where you're comfortable 
that even if other people come and change things up here, it's not going to affect inside of my thing. At Google, you should see the guidelines they have where it's like, if you do a style sheet, thou shalt do this, just so you don't mess, accidentally mess up the uh, toolbar along the top of all the properties. It's very complicated. But this makes it, allows it to be much easier. Making many uses fully, uh, fully declarative. So a lot of people aren't really, they didn't, don't have a CS degree. They know how to write HTML. They don't know how to write code. And this allows them to very simply use these components and actually sometimes have them do very interesting things without writing a single bit of code. And that's really powerful. Uh, declarative also goes faster. It's less code to ship down the wire um, because you're using more of the web platform to its full potential. It also means that we can write it in, in native code and just make it go faster. Script has gotten really, really, really fast, but it's never going to be quite as fast as native code. So, and then as we make optimizations, your thing gets faster automatically. And finally, the rise in shared semantics. So today, uh, it's hard for people to say, hey, I think we should have a tab strip, and that should be part of the platform. That should be something that just ships in every browser. Um, but if everyone can agree, as this whole community can basically define these, uh, these components that are useful to them, and everyone sort of stabilizes on the same basic semantics for how these things should work, well, that's a natural thing to promote and make into the HTML5 spec and become a part of the web platform. So this is the way for you guys to start experimenting and showing us which things you'd like to be in the platform and just ship inside the box with your, with your browser. And that's one of the most powerful things, I think, about web components. So I told you I was from the future. I'm, the good news is I'm not that far from the future. Shadow DOM and CSS variables are shipping in Chrome soon, CSS variables very soon. Um, and the thing is that once you have these technologies, we can actually polyfill them pretty, pretty, uh, pretty closely. Um, the other thing, too, is that other browser vendors, including uh, folks at Microsoft, uh, folks at Mozilla, folks at other browsers and all the standards bodies, have been actively participating in the spec for the past couple of years. We've seen a great engagement from everyone. This is not something that Google is going off and doing on the, on the side at all. This is something that's definitely on the road to becoming a, a, a specification that is well on the road to becoming a, a, a true standard. So what you can do is help the future arrive faster. The, there's only one link on here if you take this short link. That's our uh, Google Plus page for web components. It's where we post interesting articles about this kind of stuff, updates to the spec. Following the actual spec discussions is very, very difficult. It's very abstract and technical. Um, but here's where we have interesting summaries to follow. And then we also have, uh, Dimitri has written a really great and very readable uh, intro to all the different uh, technologies and web components. The CSS variable spec will tell you how to use that kind of stuff. Uh, you can read the discussions on the, uh, the standardization lists if you really want to. It's, it's kind of difficult, uh, it's kind of hard to follow along. But the coolest thing is experimenting. So we have a polyfill right now that in browsers with Shadow DOM support, so in Chrome, uh, with an option turned on, basically all this stuff just works. In fact, that's how our demo works here, is we had Shadow DOM turned on and we just used this polyfill. So you can start experimenting with these concepts, providing feedback, saying, ooh, this is really cool, or this is great, except for this one thing that's kind of weird. We can fix that in the spec if it's early enough. Then also Mozilla, a guy named Daniel Bookner at uh, Mozilla has built a really cool library called X Tags. It basically polyfills just the custom elements section of, of web components. But it's actually a production thing that works in almost all browsers that you can use today. That's a really cool thing to check out. If you go to our Plus page, uh, about a month ago we posted all of these links there and you can find all of them there. Uh, so that's it. That's all I had. Uh, no one owns it. It's it's uh, the people who are happen to be most interested in it and driving the spec and the discussions and evangelizing are people who work at Google, but it's very truly a cross browser, cross vendor, uh, cross standards body uh, collaborative collaborative. Other than Mozilla, uh, Microsoft has been so. It, in you'll see if you look in the public standards list, we've got great questions and engagement from everybody on here, including Facebook. We initiated it. We initiated it. You initiated. Uh, and uh, Dimitri Glaskov in particular, the guy okay. with the blog. Absolutely. In fact, I think a world that we're going to see in the, in the future when people can start using web components in all browsers, I think you'll see a style of development uh, come about where everything is components all the way down, and each component has a relatively thin layer of script that just creates the subcomponents it needs and instantiates them. Um, so I think a very different uh, uh, form of development will, will come about when components is, is a wider deployed thing.
where everyone goes. Uh, thank you for coming, really, thank you. We were thrilled to see you all come out, especially in the weather.